Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an attendee in listen-only mode. CEO, Sean O'Connor, and the company's CFO, John Kneisel. An opportunity to ask questions will follow today's presentation. You may send your written questions using the questions pane on your control panel, or you may use the handwriting icon on your control panel to ask your questions directly. Please be sure to enter your unique audio pen displayed when you join the call. Before beginning, I'd like to remind everyone that with the exception of historical information, the matters discussed in this presentation are forward-looking statements that involve a number of risks and uncertainties. The actual results of the company could differ significantly from those statements. Factors that can cause or contribute to such differences include, but are not limited to, continued demand for the company's products, the competitive factors, the company's ability to finance future growth, the company's ability to produce and market new products in a timely fashion, the company's ability to continue to attract and retain skilled personnel, and the company's ability to sustain or improve the current levels of productivity. Further information on the company's risk factors is contained in the company's quarterly and annual reports and follows the Securities and Exchange Commission. With that said, I'd like to turn the call over to CEO, Sean O'Connor. Sean? Thank you, Cameron. This was an excellent quarter for Simulations Plus, despite challenging economic conditions resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Fortunately, the pandemic's impact to our company has been relatively minimal, and in the third quarter of fiscal year 2020, we delivered another strong quarter of results. We have stated goal of delivering organic revenue growth of 15 to 20%, and we again exceeded that goal with 24% revenue growth in total, 18% organic revenue growth. This was our fourth consecutive quarter with total revenue growth in excess of 20%. Our software revenues represented 56% of our total revenue and grew 18% to 6.8 million, while our service revenue represented 44% of total revenue and grew 32% year over year to 5.5 million. Notably, each of our operating divisions delivered double digit revenue growth, ranging from 12 to 39%. Our gross margin improved to 78% overall Software gross rent margin was 90% in this a seasonally high revenue growth quarter. Service gross margin rose to 63% in the quarter, driven by excellent performance by our Cognigen division. Excluding the effect of one-time transaction expenses of $1.1 million from our acquisition of Blixoft, our profitability metrics in the third quarter all showed improvement. SG&A expense was 32%, in line with our expectations of 35% for the year. Net income before taxes as a percentage of revenue was 40%. Earnings per share, excluding the impact of acquisition expenses, was 20 cents, up 25% over last year. And finally, EBITDA as a percentage of revenue was 46%, again, excluding the one-time acquisition expenses. This was an excellent quarter for the company. Thankfully, the impact of the COVID pandemic on us here at Simulations Plus has been relatively minimal. From an operations perspective, we successfully transitioned our workforce to a remote model for most of the quarter, with a small group beginning to return to work on a voluntary basis in June. Fortunately, prior to the start of our stay-at-home orders, we already had approximately 40% of our workforce working remotely, and nearly everyone was equipped with the tools to make the transition from office to home rather seamlessly. As a result, there was minimal internal disruption to our business and productivity remains high. I anticipate the remote workforce percentage will remain high on an ongoing basis into the future. Our workforce is highly engaged in the support of our clients and the pursuit of new business. We are advantaged with a portfolio of business that is largely insulated from the market cycles and shocks such as the COVID pandemic. A high percentage of our revenues, approximately 85% of our software revenue and 47% of total company revenue this quarter was derived from software renewals, which have experienced no impact to date. Our service business operates off a large backlog, which we continually review and validate. Our backlog at the end of the third fiscal quarter was more than $12 million, representing more than three quarters worth of average service revenue into the future. At this point in time, we anticipate any impact to our backlog from the COVID virus will be less than 10%. 
just as important, our strong balance sheet and cash position are more than adequate to support the final, the ongoing operations of our business, initiatives for growth, and track record of consistent quarterly dividends. We ended the quarter with more than $7 million in cash and added an additional $3.5 million credit facility as a backstop. Credit facility remains undrawn. That is not to say that we have not seen some impact during these difficult times. As previously communicated, securing new business has been impacted as the pandemic has disrupted our clients' decision-making and spending activities. For most of the third quarter, we experienced a slowdown in new business closures, both in terms of new software licenses, especially in Asia, and new service business. However, lead generation, virtual meetings, and presentations are continuing in both our software and services businesses. With the cancellation of most industry conferences, we have been able to conduct trainings and workshops virtually and have successfully transitioned sales activities from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual meetings. As a result, our pipeline of vetted new business opportunities is growing. And exiting the fiscal third quarter at the end of May, we began to see an increase in new business closures for new software license agreements and consulting contracts. It's too early to assess whether the trend has changed, but I am cautiously optimistic at this time. Finally, in addition to having Monolix from Litsoft and our sales offerings, we have introduced two new service offerings that have initiated bookings in the last quarter. The two new service offerings are Strategies Plus, which provides regulatory guidance to our clients, and our COVID program, which feeds consulting assistance to any organization involved in coronavirus research. Both are generating new opportunities and bookings. Let me now turn to a brief comment or two specific to each division. At our Lancaster division, revenue was up 12% to 6.7 million for the quarter. Breaking this down, 79% of Lancaster revenue was derived from renewals, 10% from new sales, and 11% from consulting services. In our software business, renewal rates remained high at 88% on an account basis and 94% on a fee basis. New licensing units grew by 10% year over year. Our new regulatory services offering generated approximately $250,000 in bookings during the third quarter. And we added 11 new commercial companies, including new licenses in the US, Europe, Japan, and Brazil, while also expanding our presence with nonprofits, research groups, academic institutions, and regulatory agencies. We're engaged in Lancaster in projects with 28 companies and seven funded collaborations. We ended the quarter with 45 full-time employees at our Lancaster division, up one from 44 in the prior quarter and up four from 41 last year. At our Buffalo division, revenue was up 20% to $3 million for the quarter. Just as important, we made significant improvement in our gross margin, which increased to 56% of revenue, up from 52% in the year ago quarter, as the division focused on internal project process efficiencies. We signed 33 contracts and initiated 18 new projects during the quarter. Overall, we have 64 active projects across 31 companies and 28 proposals outstanding with 24 different companies as of July 1st. We ended the third quarter with 45 full-time employees at our Buffalo division, down seven from 52 in the prior quarter, and level with 45 last year. These comparisons are impacted by a reduction implemented in software development staff, no longer required to support project work efforts. The underlying growth of consulting staff is 41% year over year. Our daily sim revenue increased 39% for the quarter to 1.9 million. Breaking this down, revenue related to Dillysim software and service projects represented approximately 55% of the total. Radisim model services represented 5%. IPF model services represented 22%. And Renasim grant service revenues represented 10%. And finally, the heart failure model contributed uh, revenues uh, 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 totaling about 8%. 
Dillison has 13 active consulting projects and seven active consortium contracts at this time. We ended the quarter with 21 full-time employees at our RTP division, up three from 18 in the prior quarter and up four from 17 last year. During the quarter, we completed our acquisition of Lixoft, the developer of the highly regarded Monolix suite, a modeling platform that covers a wide range of data types and statistical features for population PKPD modeling that is widely used by academia, pharma, and regulatory agencies. This acquisition immediately expanded our presence in Europe and rebalanced our mix of software and consulting revenues with a shift weighted more towards software licensing. Lixoft contributed two months of performance to our results in the third quarter, totaling about 600,000 of revenue, which represents a 15% growth over their revenues in the same period last year, while independent, operating independently. Their customer count is 52, a 23% increase over last year, and their software renewal rates are 84% on fees and 98% on accounts. Post-acquisition integration efforts are going well. These efforts are focused in four primary areas. First, the integration of Monolix into existing direct and distributor sales processes. Second, the evaluation of integrated software product development plans. And third, the initiation of Monolix-based consulting service offerings and the training of our consulting staffs on the platform. Finally, the integration of the Lixoft organization into the company's business processes and infrastructure where appropriate. I'm pleased to report that while just at their beginnings, progress is being made across all these objectives. I'll now turn the call over to John to review the detailed financial results. John. Uh, thank you, Sean, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sean indicated, this was an excellent quarter for Simulations Plus. Our consolidated net revenues for the third quarter of our fiscal year 2020 were up 23.8% or 2.4 million to 12.3 million from just under 10 million the prior year. The third quarter represents the fourth consecutive quarter of revenue growth greater than 20%. On an organic basis, which includes the Lixoft Act, which excludes the Lixoft acquisition, our revenue grew 18%. Organic revenue remains steady in the high teens despite current economic conditions triggered by COVID-19. The general sectors we operate in, software and life science pharmaceutical, have tended to maintain momentum in the midst of the pandemic. Consolidated software and software-related sales increased uh, 1.03 million, or 17.7% over the prior year quarter. Lipsoft software sales accounted for $566,000, or 55% of this increase. Consolidating, consolidated and uh, analytical study revenues increased 1.33 million, or 32.4% over the third quarter of 19. Costs of revenues increased 14.7%, or $341,000, resulting from increases in labor-related costs and direct expenses on contracts. We saw a decrease in travel and travel-related expenses of $154,000 as training was done online due to travel restrictions. In addition, this quarter we recorded a benefit for royalties of $189,000 as a royalty agreement reached a final determination and amounts we had accrued were recognized back into income. Total gross profit increased 26.5% to 9.6 million, representing a 78.3% gross margin in the third quarter of the fiscal year. Historically, our highest quarter uh, seasonally compared to a 76.6% gross margin in the same quarter last year. Overall software margins were 90% and consulting margins were 63%. SG&A expenses, including the one-time M&A charges associated with the Lipsoft acquisition uh, of $1.1 million in the quarter, were $5 million, or 41% of revenue for the third quarter of the year, an increase of approximately $1.9 million, or 62%, compared to the prior year. 
the increase of in SG&A expenses was primarily a result of increase in selling expenses and commissions, increases in salaries and wages and labor-related benefits, as well as contract labor for outsourced services uh, in support of company growth. 195,000 of the increase came from our new subsidiary during the two months since acquisition. And as I indicated earlier, we uh, incurred approximately 1.1 million of acquisition related costs in the quarter for legal, accounting, due diligence, and M&A banker related fees. Without M&A transaction related costs, SSG&A would have been approximately 32% of revenue. And we don't expect any substantive additional M&A uh, transaction related expenses in the fiscal fourth quarter, nor do we foresee any material amounts of integration costs at this time. Research and development expenses for the third quarter were approximately 1.36 million. Of this total, 753,000 was expensed and 606,000 was capitalized. This compares to approximately a million 07 the prior year in spend, and where at that point $643,000 was expensed and $422,000 was capitalized. Income from operations was $3.9 million for both the third quarter of fiscal year 2020 and in 2019. It remained flat year over year on higher revenue, primarily affected by the one time M&A related expense of our acquisition of Licksoft. A provision for income taxes in the third quarter of the year was 844,000 with an effective tax rate of 22.3% compared to an effective rate of 25% in the prior year. The rate is lower this period mainly due to the effect of stock compensation related deductions. We expect our tax rate to end up in the 22 to 25% range for this fiscal year. Net income increased 1.6% or approximately 47,000 to 2.9 million in the third quarter of this year compared to 2.9 million in the prior year. On a per share basis, net income was 16 cents per diluted share um, in both this fiscal year and last year. The Lixoft related transaction lowered diluted earnings per share by approximately four cents per share. EBITDA was 4.6 million in third quarter of both the fiscal year, this year, fiscal year and last year. Now, um, uh, turning to the next slide is the nine month, uh, nine month year to date comparisons. Consolidated net revenues year to date were up 23.5% or 6.1 million to 32 million dollars compared to 25.9 million a year ago. Our gross margin for the first nine months of fiscal 2020 was 75.1 compared to 74% in the year ago quarter or the year ago uh, period and improvement of 110 basis points. SGNA expenses, including 1.4 million of one-time M&A transaction related costs were 12.6 million or 39.4% of revenue for the first nine months of the fiscal year 2020 compared to 8.6 or 33.2% of revenue for the same period last year. Research and development expenses were 3.8 million for the first nine months up about 500,000 from 3.3 the prior year. The expense portion increased $130,000 to 2.03 million. Year to date R&D expense is at 6.3% of revenue down from 7.3% in the prior year. Income from operations for the first nine months of fiscal 2020 was 9.4 million compared to 8.7 million. The net income increased by approximately 620,000 or 9.5 percent to 7.1 million. Diluted earnings per uh, share was 39 cents per share compared to 36 for the same period last year. The software related, uh, the Licksoft related transactions lowered EPS by approximately six cents per share year to date. EBITDA was 11.5 million 
uh, year to date up 7% from the prior year. And turning to some graphs, uh, this graph shows consolidated quarterly revenues. The third quarter of each fiscal year is typically our strongest, followed by a decrease in revenue in the fourth quarter that coincides with the slowdown in our clients purchasing in the summer months. Once again, the first through third quarters of fiscal 2020 followed the same upward trend. The next slide represents operating income by quarter, illustrating a consistent track record of increases both year over year and sequentially through the first and third quarters with the fourth quarter lighter for the year. As you can see, the patterns for quarterly revenues and quarterly income from operations have largely held through, true for quite a number of years. This quarter, we were flat compared to last year. Uh, again, the result of 1.1 million of non-recurring and non-operational costs related to the Licksoft acquisition. The next slide of consolidated net income by quarter, we can see that similar pattern in net income in the third quarter typically being the strongest. The graph, ice, the graph isolates the impact of a $1.5 million deferred tax benefit in the second quarter of fiscal year 18, since it tends to skew the presentation without highlighting that difference. And again, this quarter we were flat compared to last year, the result of the cost of the Licksoft acquisition. On the next slide, diluted earnings per share follows the same pattern and tracks with net income as expected. As I mentioned earlier, fiscal year 2020 third quarter diluted earnings per share were 16 cents and included M&A transaction costs for Licksoft. Excluding those non-recurring expenses, earnings per share would have been approximately uh, four cents more. Uh, turning to EBITDA on the next slide, again, the patterns, patterns hold for EBITDA with the overall trends moving upward and to the right and typical seasonality uh, exists between the quarters. Let me mention one thing about the trends in our fiscal performance. Uh, like so many, we are unable to truly predict all the possible future impact of COVID-19 with any degree of certainty. However, based on our current visibility, we expect the seasonal nature of our revenue, income, and EPS to continue in the coming quarters based on our annual software revenue renewal model consulting backlog and our pipeline of new business opportunities. This slide shows our, our revenue by region on a year-to-date basis. We sell globally with the majority of our revenue in the Western Hemisphere. Approximately 69% of revenues were in the Americas year-to-date this year, while Europe representing 16% and Asia 15% half of which sales were derived from sales in Japan. On the next slide, it illustrates our strength of our cash position with a quarterly view of our cash balance and how we've used funds for investing through acquisitions and returns to shareholders in the form of cash dividends. The red line indicates lower points of cash at times when we have invested in acquisitions. The green bar represents cash use for acquisitions with 6 million net cash paid in the most recent quarter of our, for our acquisition of Licksoft. Cash flows from operations have allowed us to invest for future growth through acquisitions while maintaining a healthy balance sheet. After each acquisition, you can see a pattern of cash accumulation. Beginning with the first quarter of 17 on the far left, the blue bar at the bottom illustrates a consistent dividend payout with approximately 900,000 per fiscal year through fiscal year 17. And then beginning of 18, the board increased the dividend payment to six cents a share, thereby returning a million to a million one in cash to our shareholders quarterly through the present quarter. Today in our press release, we again announced that the board of directors has voted to continue the six cent quarterly dividend the next dividend payment will be August 3rd. Our reinvestment through acquisitions has exceeded 16 million over the last four to five fiscal years. While we have also returned more than 15 million to our shareholders through consistent dividend payouts, 
without the use of any borrowed debt. During the third quarter, as Sean mentioned uh, before, we established a three and a half million dollar line of credit with the commercial bank. Under the terms of the yellow sea, drawn amounts in current interest at prime rate or at a fixed rate based on LIBOR plus 175 basis points. It's a two year agreement and there are no charges for undrawn line amounts. At the end of our third quarter, we had nothing drawn under the facility and do not anticipate a need to access the line in the near future. However, it does provide us with access to liquidity should the need arise. Turning to the next slide, view with the balance sheet metrics. At the end of the quarter, cash was at 7.4 million, which was down 35% compared to the last fiscal year, primarily the result of cash used in the acquisition of Litsoft. Current ratios and liability changes are mainly the result of any acquisition liabilities booked. Our balance sheet remains strong with excess cash and zero borrowed debt. With our continued cash flow generation and a prudent approach to allocating capital, we're well positioned to support our continued growth and protect our business during economic cycles. Sean, I'll turn the call back to you now. Thank you, John. Additionally, today we filed an audit, uh, a uh, shelf registration on Form S3 with the SEC. The registration statement and prospectus allow the company to register various securities, including common or preferred stock, as well as warrants and or depository shares. We have not filed a specific prospectus supplement to initiate an offering at this time, but have put the shelf registration in place for use in the future and in support of working capital, M&A, and other general corporate purposes. Our recent qualification under the well-known seasoned issuer rules made this undertaking timely and efficient. In conclusion, we are well positioned to continue our record of strong financial performance and encouraged by the prospects for our business despite the lingering unknowns related to the COVID pandemic. We are out of the gate strong with the integration of Lexoft and encouraged by opportunities that business that, that business opens up for us, particularly in Europe. Demand for our solutions remains strong, although we may experience delays in the timing of customer orders. We're confident any short-term disruptions in the flow of new license orders will not impact the long-term prospects for our business or the thesis for investing in Simulations Plus. We expect double-digit year-over-year revenue growth in the fiscal fourth quarter, despite the impact of seasonality on a sequential basis. With that, I'd like to turn the call back to the operator, Cameron, and take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Sean. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question using the telephone, please use the hand raising icon on the control panel. Be sure to enter the audio pin um, that's unique for each individual user. Please hold one second while we poll for the live questions. And our first question comes from Matt Hewitt, the analyst with Craig Hallam. Thank you uh, for taking the questions and congratulations on the strong third quarter. Thanks, Matt. How are you doing? Uh, we're hanging in there. Um, I guess uh, first off, could you maybe talk a little bit, and you, you touched on this, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the cadence that we know that there was a little bit of slowdown on new customer bookings um, in the quarter, but how how has that cadence changed, I guess, as the quarter progressed, and, and where do things kind of sit now? Are you seeing a, a, a stronger uptrend there, or is it still some hesitancy? Well, yeah, I, I describe it this way, this way, Matt. We we went into the quarter with uh, a reduction, reducing our expectation in terms of uh, new licenses, new consulting contracts. Uh, we saw that. Uh, in the last month of our second quarter and went into the third quarter anticipating uh, a relatively slow pace. That slow pace, uh, you know, came, came to reality and, and during the year our closure of new business was, was well below what uh, historically we, we've seen. Uh, we did see as we entered the last month of, uh, of our quarter, May, uh, that uh, things picked up a little bit. 
um, and uh, look at that very, very optimistically. Uh, but I just don't know that it's something, a, a trend change that uh, we can hang our hat on just yet. Uh, and so we're, you know, cautiously looking into the fourth quarter that we will remain uh, impacted by uh, COVID slowdown. Uh, as we look at our customers across the board, uh, kind of like the pandemic uh, response in general, uh, I think people started to come back and, and activity started to pick up. Uh, and uh, maybe has taken a little step back uh, as infection rates, et cetera, have um, uh, stepped up. And so uh, I want to be optimistic. Uh, we certainly uh, did better than we anticipated on reduced expectations in May, the last month of the third quarter. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to say that that's a, a positive uptick, a positive trend forward. Uh, but I don't think it's a big enough data point uh, for us yet to say that uh, things have turned in the marketplace for us. We'll, we'll remain uh, cautious as we go into the fourth quarter. Understood. Okay, and then I guess kind of moving down the income statement, gross margin, that was your high watermark going back to all the way to uh, Q3 of 2017. How sustainable, and I, I appreciate some of the seasonality, but how sustainable is this um, gross margin given some of the changes in um, you know, working from home and, and, and kind of the mix, adding Licksoft with uh, the higher software margin, but how should we be thinking about gross margin? Yeah, I don't see that anything too significant has happened in there other than uh, of recent uh, improved uh, margins out of uh, our Cognigen consulting uh, operations where we've found some efficiencies and uh, started to implement them and, and they had a very good quarter. Again, the third quarter is our highest revenue quarter from a seasonality perspective. And so we benefit uh, as we add uh, uh, expenses on more or less a, a linear basis through the year. Our peak revenue is uh, uh, it arrives here in the third quarter. And then uh, as the seasonality dictates, we'll step down in the fourth quarter. And you'll see the pattern uh, on an annual basis is pretty consistent that that gross margin will be impacted. Uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, so I point you to the year-over-year -year, uh, gross revenue results, which are, you know, a little bit improved over over last year, if you will. Uh, so we're seeing some improvements there. Obviously, Lixoft uh, coming into the mix adds uh, more software, high high gross margin software to our mix, takes our, our overall revenue back to you know more of a closer to a 55-45. Uh, split between the two sources of revenue, and that certainly have, helps gross margin as well. Um, so a uh, little bit of improvement on the uptick, uh, but as you as you model and look forward, uh, keep in mind uh, that there's a seasonality uh, factor in, in play here. Got it. All right, maybe one more, and then I'll hop back into queue. Um, given the strong performance that you've put it, been putting up and the balance sheet, um, your profitability, is there, have you had any discussions internally with the board um, regarding maybe taking on a little bit of risk with some of your customers? And, and what I'm, I guess, asking is, is there any chance that you could start to look at some of your customers and say, you know, instead of charging you X, we would be interested in essentially partnering with you where we're going to collect milestones and royalties as your um, pipeline opportunities are successful. Is that, has that, uh, you know, discussion come up and, and what are your thoughts on that type of a model? Uh, it's a big change uh, in terms of uh, our, our, our model today being a traditional mix of uh, software and, and consulting uh, revenues. We've always focused on returning uh, very good profitability uh, metrics uh, uh, on a quarterly basis, uh, a change to a royalty a milestone um, uh, betting on the the, the future uh, would would impact that tremendously. So that would be a, a significant change in in our approach. Uh, we certainly do look at situations where can we package our services in different uh, forms of service offerings. Um, that uh, you know may lead us uh, into areas where we're looking at uh, delivering consulting results that uh, for the client it uh, helps them today uh, doesn't pay off for them to, in, into longer road longer uh, term down the road, uh, which might prompt royalties into the discussion. 
Um, we're, we're, we're not close to making any of those uh, sort of changes in, in our business model at this point in time and feel comfortable that we're able to de deliver a, a good value to our clients at, uh, at a good return to, to us and the shareholders in our current model today. Fair enough. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And our next question is from Kevin Gade of Bill Gainer. Kevin, your line is now live. Hi, good afternoon and uh, congratulations on a strong quarter. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring up the, uh, the shelf registration. Uh, it seems like some of the commentary, it, it discussed the timeliness of uh, being able to, um, you know, uh, become a, a, a serial issuer. Um, is this timely in the sense that you are looking to engage more in M&A? Uh, and if you do so, uh, are you looking to use anything other than accumulated cash on your balance sheet? Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, certainly it's something, uh, shelf registration is something that we've looked at for some time and considered uh, to be appropriate for a company and our size, shape, and, and, and whatnot. Uh, uh, achieving the uh, Wixie uh, threshold um, a month ago, put us in a position where uh, the ease of filing that uh, registration statement was uh, facilitated uh, immensely in a review period, uh, uh, being a, a big piece of it uh, and, and other benefits as well. Um, in terms of uh, its potential use out in the future, it doesn't change our approach uh, in terms of modeling, uh, no modeling, but uh, merger and acquisition activity. Uh, it's an ongoing effort on our part. Uh, we closed Lixoft a couple of months ago. Uh, the third acquisition the company has made. Um, and as I've said before, you know, we've done it on kind of an every three year basis. And I hope that that uh, uh, window is shortened and uh, we're able to move, uh, identify and uh, take action on uh, appropriate uh, target candidates uh, on a quicker pace here. Uh, the shelf there being there will allow us uh, some ease and speed in terms of responding, uh, depending on the nature of those transactions uh, and the need for uh, shares uh, uh, and or cash to uh, to move on those. Uh, we've made a good cash position already, and as we've done with the other acquisitions, funded them out of existing resources, existing capital. Um, if anything, this might give us an opportunity uh, to look at uh, target uh, opportunities that are a little bit larger down the road. Uh, hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's very helpful. And uh, maybe if you can uh, discuss briefly the valuation of of some of the targets that you're that you've been looking at, uh, is 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 the opportunity set uh, within your expected range perhaps some um, intriguing? And then lastly, uh, you had brought you you had put out a PR about. Uh, partnering with COVID uh, research organizations. Has there been any product wins related to COVID-19, um, either antivirals or vaccines from Simulation Plus? In terms of the uh, uh, M&A target list, I mean, the values uh, run from small to large, large being defined um, historically as to what we had an appetite to and could bite off the three previous transactions. You know, we're all in uh, sort of $20 million and below uh, size. Um, as I said, uh, the uh, target list, if you will, might uh, expand in terms of its valuation size uh, as we as we go forward. Um, uh, with regard to the uh, COVID efforts out there, yeah, it's been a fast and furious market. We've tried to be a good citizen and, and uh, in many ways contribute some of our, our knowledge or past experience and in, in model efforts to date uh, on, an, on a gratis basis in some scenarios, uh, counting on the fact that they would translate to commercial opportunities uh, going forward. Uh, we've had some small realities in that regard, and we've got a pipeline of discussions and grant proposals and uh, number number of opportunities in, in process and in the pipeline uh, going forward. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, if you'd like to ask a live question, please do the hand raising icon with the unique audio pin. And while we, we poll for additional questions, I will go through some of the questions that have been sent in. 
Um, the first question is from Howard Halperin with Taglitz Brothers. His first question is, what will drive improvements in potential gross and operating margins over the next 12 months? Uh, well, you know, obviously the two biggest impacts on, on, on those uh, percentage results, uh, operating expenses and gross, uh, gross margin are uh, A, our overall revenue growth. Uh, uh, as we get larger, there are certain fixed expenses that, uh, that, that don't rise with the, the revenue growth and we'll see, see a little bit of improvement there. Uh, the other big impact is the mix of our software and consulting uh, revenues. Um, consulting uh, opportunities, consulting revenue continues to to grow at uh, 30 percent uh, plus uh, uh, ranges, um, and uh, the software in the 15 percent uh, level. Uh, and so we have a continual uh, mix change that takes place. Uh, we look to keep that uh, <clears throat> in the favor of software uh, uh, through internal development of, of products and driving uh, so existing portfolio of uh, software products, uh, revenue growth at a faster pace. Uh, and then obviously, as with Lexoft, add to the software side of our business through, uh, through acquisitions going forward. Thank you, Sean. Um, next question from Howard is, over the next 12 months, what are the gross prospects for the European subsidiary? Lixoff well, has uh, uh, very consistently grown the last uh, couple, three years at a uh, 30% top line growth rate. Uh, they've enjoyed a little bit, uh, you know, the rule of small numbers there uh, as they've climbed their way to, you know, a three to $4 million uh, annual level of, uh, of, of, of revenue. Uh, we, uh, you know, uh, are uh, pleased with their results in the first couple of months here. We only get uh, a partial quarter. Um, and uh, as they've come on board, uh, they are seeing the same impacts that uh, uh, that our existing software business uh, uh, has encountered as a result of the uh, COVID uh, uh, situation. So, uh, you know, their growth rate uh, out to shoot here as part of the Simulations Plus family. Uh, I would anticipate uh, may come down from that 30% growth level that they've enjoyed uh, for the last few years. Uh, but in the long run, they certainly will grow uh, in the uh, 15 to 20% uh, range that uh, that we've been uh, touting here in terms of our ability to grow on an organic basis. They should fit well into that. Uh, and might be able to contribute to, at the high or above uh, side of that, uh, depending on how quickly and when and, and how we come out of uh, uh, the COVID, uh, COVID scenario. Um, their revenues are 100% uh, software upon acquisition, 99%, I guess, or you know, some small contribution on, on the service side. And, uh, but that's an upside. And so in terms of looking at, uh, at, at, at Europe uh, and really globally, uh, our ability to uh, take advantage of consulting business that is drawn to uh, or tied to the Monolix Suite uh, application presents an opportunity for uh, contribution of revenues uh, going forward as well. Um, so an exciting, exciting addition to the mix here and uh, gotten off to a very good start in the first couple, three months uh, since they've joined the team and uh, look forward to uh, seeing what we can do with it going, going forward. Thank you, Sean. The next question from Howard is, on top of the $5 million five-year Kiwi contract, has Kiwi in the offering made any inroads as the need for security is increasing during the drug development process? Um, you know, I, I'd say of late, uh, you know, certainly making uh, big investments in Kiwi-like uh, data repository decisions uh, impacted uh, Probably more uh, significantly than uh, analytical tools like uh, Castro Plus, Monolix. Uh, uh, those are the types of decisions that have been uh, shelved uh, in terms of our, our, our clients out there in the, in, in the marketplace. So, uh, you know, I think my response there is no, not, not seen any, uh, any uptick uh, in, in that, uh, that uh, area of our business at all. Great, thank you. 
Uh, the final question from Howard Halpern is, for modeling purposes, what is a likely quarterly increase in DNA expense related to the Lixoff acquisition? DNA expense, I, I presume, is, is maybe a typo, SGNA expense. Um, and uh, Just I'd depreciation that, name and raise it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At the SGNA level, certainly I'll respond. Uh, their model fits in uh, right with ours, and so our expectation that uh, we're kind of operating operating on an annualized uh, 35% SGNA uh, level uh, looks off will fit right in, into that um, uh, relatively small operation uh, in its consolidation into our numbers. Uh, no dramatic change there. Thank you, John. If, if the question a... is more is more cash oriented in terms of EBITDA percentage, uh, looks off is a is a fine addition and will contribute more significantly, more positively on an EBITDA sort of perspective because. Their overall margins uh, uh, are uh, you know, even, even even better than than our pre-consolidation uh, EBITDA percentages at uh, at Sun Plus. So uh, they will come, uh, contribute disproportionately in terms of increasing uh, cash flow and EBITDA. Thank you, Sean. And we have a few written questions um, from Brett Gasacchio but he is on the line live. So we'll let them ask those questions live first and then follow up with any of the, uh, the written questions that he submitted. Brett. Hello, uh, hello. Your I'm live here. is live. No. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Brett. Yes, you're live. Yeah, so uh, thank you for taking my question. The first question is, uh, what is your current marketing slash sales approach to distribution your software to other pharma companies, uh, chemical companies, et cetera? And do you have any uh, plans to expand your proprietary software to the enter enterprise resource planning space outside of pharma biochemicals or more so manufacturing in uh, other, other markets? And then the second question is Japan seems like a huge opportunity for you that is prime for penetration and growth. Um, what is your sales and market pro marketing approach there? Um, to grow revenue. Sure, Brett. Uh, I'll, I'll walk through them. Um, you know, our current uh, sales uh, process is uh, both direct and uh, through distributors. Uh, uh, the distributor network is utilized in the Asian markets, uh, and uh, the rest of the uh, world is uh, a direct uh, sales effort uh, on our part. Um, you know, turning to, uh, I guess the second part of that first, first question is in terms of expansion outside of the, uh, pharma space, uh, not as far reaching as, uh, generic ERP spaces, uh, manufacturing. Uh, we do, uh, uh impact, uh, it can impact certain pharmaceutical manufacturing, uh, decisions and, and activities, but, uh, uh, if the question is from an ANSYS sort of perspective of applying our modeling and service to uh, a wider range of uh, industries, the answer is, uh, is no. We'll, we'll stay focused in our pharmaceutical space and the uh, adjacencies to it. Um, the Japanese market uh, uh, is, is, yes, uh, one of the larger uh, uh, Non-North American markets, Europe and Asia being the uh, the, the two two big markets for us outside of North America. Uh, Japan, uh, as I said, we we use distributors there for our software products, and on a consulting side, uh, we do some business in, in Japan. We do uh, you know a fair percentage of business for Japan through their Japanese representation uh, companies here. In, uh, North America, their uh, subsidiaries in, in North America. Uh, the opportunity exists at some point in the future. Uh, uh, seeing other consulting organizations of our uh, ilk uh, see some of success when they uh, have consultants on the ground in Japan uh, would contribute, I think, to uh, a greater capture of market share uh, in that regard. And that's something that we certainly look at uh, in the future, but haven't pulled the trigger on doing something of that nature uh, at this time. Uh, just yet. Hopefully that, that touches on your questions. Thank you, Sean. And then we have uh, one follow-up question from Kevin Gates. I'll unmute his line now. Kevin, you're now live. 
Hi, uh, thanks again for taking my follow up. Um, my question is just generally, uh, if you can kind of speak to the resilience of the software and modeling industry within the pharma space and uh, maybe talk about the long term growth aspect. It just, just seems like uh, this, uh, where you are in the drug creation space is, is almost perpetually growing. Um, so just perhaps talk to uh, any puts and takes to, to what you all have seen over the past several months as it looks to the future. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it's an exciting market for me from my perspective of, of, of having been involved for 20 years now. Um, those early days of banging our head on, on, on the cement wall at, uh, at a large pharma company and uh, trying to get that uh, initial adoption uh, initiated, uh, we've come a long way from at uh, that point in time. And today, uh, it's certainly uh, accepted and adopted and flourishing in terms of its expanded application, <clears throat> both along the timeline of discovery to approval, uh, as well as uh, uh, the various uh, means uh, through those, between those two points in terms of impacting decisions, uh, prioritizing molecules, uh, uh, affecting bioequivalence uh, decisions, uh, impacting FDA response to uh, submissions, uh, the list goes on. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we've been gated over time as well <clears throat> by the available resources that are out there, the number of scientists that have this uh, relatively unique mix of uh, math, statistics, biology, chemistry, et cetera, uh, that are able to uh, drive the uh, drive the software, if you will. Uh, we today uh, have uh, numerous academic uh, uh, organizations producing uh, candidates that uh, are populating the the field uh, and uh, allowing more resources in that regard. That is uh, supporting uh, the growth and adoption of modeling and simulation in the pharma space. Um, I look at, uh, you know, one of the silver linings of uh, the COVID pan pandemic here, uh, if we can search for those things, uh, is the uh, heightened awareness of, uh, gee, it just takes too damn long to develop a drug, and it seems to be such a painful process. How can we improve it? And uh, uh, that's what modeling and simulation delivers to the, to the industry. Um, so we're getting some attention. Uh, it's well deserved. Uh, we can be very impactful uh, in terms of the efficiency and effectiveness of the drug development cycle. Uh, and as I look out uh, into the future, uh, I don't see any end to uh, this uh, expansion of application and modeling and simulation in new and different ways uh, that can impact uh, our clients uh, and uh, uh, very excited uh, about the future uh, for modeling and simulation. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Sean. And this concludes the conference call today. Thank you, everyone. If you've missed any part of today's conference call, the replay will be available on our website, www.simulations-plus.com. Thank you, and look forward to the next earnings call to further our dialogue. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.